so welcome back. This is the second video in Linux Academy's Bootloading with Grub Quick Start, and in this video we're going to discuss MBR and GPT partitions. Now most lock storage devices provide a mechanism for storage to be divided up into multiple parts. These individual parts are called partitions, and they're used for a variety of purposes. If you're familiar with Unix or Linux or VMS, you'll recall that swap is often created in its own partition. This means it has its own dedicated area on the disk media. MBR partitions have several limitations apart from those related to its tight coupling with BIOS and CHS. MBR partitions always must start on a track boundary and end on a cylinder boundary. And this is true whether CHS or LBA addressing is used. MBR devices always report 512 byte sector sizes. Even if the underlying device actually uses 4 kilobyte sectors, MBR reports 512 byte sector sizes, and this can lead to performance degradation. The bootable partition on an MBR drive must be marked active, and a small amount of space is left between the first sector of the drive and the first sector of the first partition, and that space is often used to store information related to the MBR or to the partition table. And since it's not allocated to a particular partition, and it really isn't protected anyway, it's often vulnerable to being overwritten or destroyed. MBR partitions may be labeled, but primarily their number is used to identify them. Now in contrast, now in contrast, GPT partitions were designed to provide the following benefits. GPT stands for Globally Unique Identifier Partition Table. So GPTs are compatible with EFI and UFI. In fact, just like MBR has a bootloader counterpart and a partitioning counterpart, GPT is EFI's partition counterpart. GPT partition drives provide a reserved EFI space specifically used to boot the system. GPT partitions also use sequential addressing, typically using LBA or CBER. They support up to 128 primary partitions. GPT drives recognize the actual sector size of the underlying block device, and they allow for a PMBR, or Protective Master Boot Record, to be used so that software or hardware, which is expecting to find an MBR or to use MBR-related data, not only can find it, but doesn't mistake the drive as being unpartitioned or damaged and thereby destroy the data on it. On systems which use BIOS, a hybrid MBR code can be installed which allows for GPT partitions to be recognized, but this code can't presume that the sector size of the underlying device is 512 bytes in size. And unlike MBR where the partitions are primarily identified by a single digit, GPT partitions are identified by a UUID, or Universally Unique Identifier. Now some final notes on MBR. For a long time it was a standard for bootloading and partitioning on the PC. The specification was updated through the years, but a few things have remained unchanged. When the computer is turned on, the CPU and BIOS expect to find the boot code at a specific address in RAM or on the hard drive, and BIOS numbers partitions in the order they exist in the MBR partition table. Now the Linux kernel might or might not maintain that ordering between boot, and that's why it's a really good idea to use disk labels or UUIDs in Etsy FS tab. A couple of quick final notes on Grub. The boot process for Grub is identical to MBR, but it's also a bit different in that Grub is actually called by MBR, and that's how Grub is executed. Part of MBR's job is to load the Grub boot code. So what that means is that MBR is always involved in the boot process of an MBR partition across the board. You really can't escape it. The only time you can escape MBR is by using a non-BIOS system, BEFI systems or ARM systems, for example, in combination with a GUID partition table. Okay, so now that we've got the background and some of the fundamentals, let's look at adding boot parameters to systems that use legacy grub. Now changes to the grub configuration when you're using legacy grub should be made in one of the following files. And these are etsygrub.conf or bootgrubgrub.conf. Legacy grub symlinks the following files to the grub.conf located in forward slash boot forward slash grub for compatibility reasons. Take note here, I've included the link to the official legacy grub manual. It's definitely worth your while to take a look at it if you find yourself using legacy grub at some point. 
Okay, so you can see I'm logged in here to a CentOS system, and this is CentOS version 6, which uses legacy grub. Now, in order to modify my grub configuration, there's only one file I have to be worried about, and that is etsygrub.com. Now, one of the neat things about legacy grub, and one of the ways in which it differs from grub2, is that you make your changes to the grub configuration file, and there's not a second step. Once you've made the changes and saved the file, you'll see them affected at the next reboot. So if I want to, for instance, boot the latest kernel rather than the second latest kernel in the list of kernels that's provided in this file, I can change my default to zero. And if I want a much longer timeout where I can select which kernel I want to boot, I can change the timeout. So I'm going to reboot the system now, and let's see what that looks like. And you can see here that we are now booting from the latest kernel, and our countdown was about 20 seconds when it started. And really, it's just that simple. You make your changes, you reboot the system, and everything falls into place. Now in our next video, we're going to take a look at how to modify our Grub2 configuration. This is George Scott with Linux Academy.